Hello everyone. Today is the 7th of July 2020. Today I want to address a bizarre comment which was made by Mr. Kembo Mohadi, who is one of Zimbabwe's two vice presidents. This comment was made at a political gathering in a small town called Gwanda in Matebeleland. It was also broadcast on the main news of the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation television, the only TV station in Zimbabwe. Vice President Mohadi asked his audience if they believed that the problems of Zimbabwe were caused by the government. It was, of course, a rhetorical question. He then went on to say, open quote, we got our political independence, but the white men never gave us the knowledge of how to run an economy, close quote. He went on to explain that the only knowledge they had received was how to run a bottle store or a general dealer, in other words, a shop. Vice President Mohadi was trying to explain the reasons why Zimbabwe is in deep trouble why Zimbabwe's economy is in the dire straits, and why the country generally is in poverty. But his explanation, the reason that he was offering, was deeply embarrassing for a number of reasons. Firstly, it reinforces some very dark stereotypes that black people cannot run governments. He was, of course, speaking on his own behalf and perhaps on behalf of his own party. But the way that such statements are taken, especially by supremacists, is that this is confirmation of what is always said, that these people cannot run governments. This could never be further from the truth. Because, of course, we know that there are so many other countries across Africa which are run well, countries where economies are improving, where indeed there are great prospects for reform and development in future. We can point to some of our neighbors in the region, countries like Botswana, countries like Namibia, which are good examples of you know, good government, fair ways of doing things. It is unfortunate that someone like Vice President Kembo Mahadi would make a statement which strengthens these very negative stereotypes. Secondly, this is coming from someone who is a senior leader of a so-called Liberation Party, which is admitting to incompetence. He basically is admitting to the fact that they did not have the competence to run government when they took over. In some ways, people like Ian Douglas Smith, the last uh, Rhodesian Prime Minister, must be having a last laugh. He, of course, once said that the nationalists did not have the craft competence to run government. And now, 40 years later, we have one of the key leaders of government, Kembo Mohadi, who is seemingly concurring with him. But why would Kembo Mohadi make such a damaging statement, a statement which is really a contradiction of everything that ZANU-PF often says about itself and about everybody else? Well, the reason is really about ZANU-PF's penchant for finding scapegoats for all the problems that they have caused. In this case, Kembo Mohadi was trying to blame the white men, was trying to blame the colonial government. Um, but, but his explanation, he did not realize that it was self-defeating because he's basically confirming what, you know, the colonial government was saying that they were not prepared for government. If they are not blaming the colonial government, they are blaming sanctions. They are also blaming droughts. If they are not blaming sanctions and droughts, they are blaming the opposition party. If they are not blaming the opposition party, they are blaming civil society. In other words, for ZANU-PF, they are always finding someone to blame. They are always looking for a scapegoat. In this particular case, they have found a scapegoat, or at least Kembo Mohadi, 
it was pointing to a scapegoat which in the overall scheme of things was actually pointing to their own failures as a government because it is an admission of incompetence that they are not well equipped with the skills to run an economy. The idea of blaming the colonial regime 40 years after independence is of course absolutely absurd. It's a, it's a bizarre way to try and absolve oneself of responsibility. They had 40 years to learn. They simply refused or neglected to learn. You can't blame someone having taken power and been in power for four decades and you still go back and blame people from whom you took power so many years ago. It's deeply embarrassing. But we must also understand that this is ZANU-PF's way of doing things. Zimbabwe is not the only country that was colonized. There are many countries around this world which have been colonies. Countries like Singapore, countries like Malaysia, Hong Kong, Botswana, Mauritius, Namibia, and many other countries which have been colonized but have done incredibly well since they became independent. Indeed, some of them, like Singapore, are considered first world countries. Mauritius is doing very well, as are countries like Botswana. One thing in common amongst all these countries is that they've had good leadership. They've had leadership that has a vision. They have had a leadership which is progressive, a leadership which is really wired towards development and progress for their people. They are not perfect. Indeed, no country is perfect. No nation is built for perfection. But they have done incredibly well ever since they became independent. They did not have the colonial governments teaching them how to run governments. They learned on the job and they have done very well. So it is absolutely pathetic to hear a vice president of Zimbabwe claiming that the country is in dire straits, that things are not well because they were not taught how to run governments by the colonial government. Number five, it is important, of course, to remember that Zimbabwe is a country of huge talent. The resources that it has are not only on the ground, in the ground, they are not just mineral resources, they are not just good soils, they are not just the physical resources that we have, they abandon the beautiful climate that we have in our, in our country. It is also in what economists would call human capital. So many young Zimbabweans, new generations that have been born after independence, who are doing incredibly well, both within the country and also abroad. Many of them are working for big companies, they are working for governments, they are working for international organizations, they are entrepreneurs where they are. They are doing so well in their trades. In South Africa, there are so many Zimbabweans who are doing so well in their trades and in their professions. So it's not for a lack of talent. It's not that Zimbabweans have not learned how to run the economy. There are so many Zimbabweans who are so capable of running the economy. But what is the problem? The problem is that these people have not been given a chance. The problem is that these young Zimbabweans are being kept outside. They are being marginalized. They are being excluded. The structures of government are still monopolized by people who believe that they have a monopoly to run the country. Their families, their associates, and even today, they are the ones who are snapping up every company every resource that you have in the country is going into the same hands. ZANU-PF is a party which believes that because it was the party that led the fight for independence, it has therefore a monopoly and continues to hold power. These are embarrassing claims that you get from a vice president when the reality is that Zimbabwe is rich in talent, which is prepared to take over and do well. People like Vice President Kembo Mahadi should by now have retired. They should be enjoying the sunset of their lives while leaving the reins of power to a younger generation that is ready to take over the reins of power, that is ready to lead the country into a more progressive and modern era. 
but unfortunately they do not want to do that and hence they end up making embarrassing statements statements that embarrass not only themselves but the rest of Zimbabweans for 20 years now we have had the movement for democratic change as a party that is offering itself as an alternative but for many elections that have come and gone they have been thwarted in those elections zanu pf has used all kinds of manipulation it has used violence people have been killed people have been raped people have been intimidated basically the situation is not conducive to free and fair elections and this has resulted in illegitimacy for the successive governments that have been in power since 2000 except of course between 2009 and 2013 when Zimbabwe had an inclusive government and that was the only point at which over the last 20 years there were some green shoots of recovery some hope some rays of hope uh, for Zimbabwe that is an example this is an example an illustration of the potential that exists within Zimbabwe but unfortunately ZANU PF does not see this ZANU PF's abysmal record in government is not just about human rights violations and poor political management it is of course very poor economic management and in that regard vice president Kempo Mohadi was right in admitting that ZANU PF is incompetent it is true just have a look at the list of companies which they inherited the abandoned assets which the zanu pf inherited in 1980 at independence air zimbabwe is the national airline it's basically a bankrupt organization zisco steel the iron and steel company which was one of the pride of the company of the country Zisco Steel is now a shell. It used to employ thousands of workers. Basically, towns grew around it and other industries were offshoots of Zisco Steel. But that company is now bankrupt. It does not exist anymore. You've got the Zimbabwe United Passenger Company, which used to be called Harare United. This was the major public transport organization in the country which provided urban transport in Harare and other cities. You, it was a modern system that you could have uh, in any part of the world. Indeed, if uh, it had remained on course, it would probably be one of the most progressive urban transport systems in Africa and did in, indeed in the world. But this also is bankrupt. It is surviving on subsidies from the state and it is not sustainable. We also had the National Railways of Zimbabwe, which was the rail company. But of course, this is also a bankrupt company. This is hugely disappointing. The NRZ is symbolic of this kind of decline. If you go back to the colonial regime, one of the first things that was done was to lay rail lines from Mutare to Harare. It was then Amtali and Salisbury and then of course to Blawayo. It was a recognition of the importance of rail networks. Indeed, if you go to many countries in the world, many progressive countries, they rely not only on road transport, but also on rail as a means of transport. Even our so-called great friends, China, they do very well in building their railway infrastructure. Countries like Ghana, Kenya, and others which are you know, trying to improve their systems. They are busy improving their rail systems. The opposite has been happening in Zimbabwe. This, of course, is a result of incompetence. We used to have an electric rail line from Harare. It ended at, at Tabuka in uh, Gweru, just after Gweru. But uh, the last time I was in Zimbabwe, I saw that some of the cables, the lines, were no longer there. They had been basically stolen, I was told, that system is dead. It does not work anymore. So basically ZANU-PF has taken us to an old era when we are supposed to be progressing into a modern era. I could make reference to so many other companies which were inherited, so many assets which were inherited at independence. 
But I should also mention the diamonds. In 2007, 2008, Zimbabwe discovered uh, diamonds, alluvial diamonds, in a place called Chiazwa. Now, this was a time when Zimbabwe was experiencing severe economic death rates. Now, instead of these assets becoming a boon for Zimbabwe, instead of these assets being the fuel that would propel Zimbabwe's economy into greater heights, Zimbabwe actually went into hyperinflation in 2008. And what happened to the diamonds? The diamonds were stolen. Many of these people, the elites, they are the ones who plundered the resource that could have propelled Zimbabwe's economy to greater heights. So Vice President Mohadi is not wrong when he says that ZANU-PF is incompetent, when he admits that they are incompetent. They do not know how to manage resources. They do not know how to manage the economy. But that does not mean that Zimbabweans as a people do not have the knowledge or the skills of running an economy. There are so many people, so many young people, both young and old, in fact, who are capable, who have the skills, who have the competence to run an economy. The only problem is that ZANU-PF is not giving them a chance. So many Zimbabweans have been speaking about Vice President Campbell Mohadi's statement. And of course, they've been asking the question, if the colonial government did not teach you how to run an economy, who taught you how to be so corrupt? This is because the ZANU-PF regime is an egregiously corrupt government. Many of the political elites, their families, their associates, they have amassed great personal wealth while the nation has become poor. Even now, when the country is in severe dire straits, when the hospitals don't even have basic drugs, when nurses and doctors are striking for better working conditions, the political elites are buying themselves luxury cars, Range Rovers, Discoveries, Toyotas, top of the range vehicles, which they are buying from Western companies, the very same countries that they blame for causing trouble for Zimbabwe. Where are they getting the money to buy all these luxury cars when Zimbabweans cannot even afford to buy basic goods, basic things like bread, like cooking oil, things that they need for their basic survival? Zimbabwe is a typical case of a country that is plagued by incompetence of its leadership, by severe corruption, by severe greed of its political elites, people who think of nobody else except their own personal interests. Last week, one of the podcasts was about Zamco, a company which was created effectively to assist these political elites to rid them of the debts that they have incurred over the years and placing the burden on the poor majority. So, in a nutshell, I would say that Vice President Kemba Mahadi was not wrong to admit to the incompetence of ZANU-PF, to the fact that he and his colleagues in ZANU-PF have failed the people of Zimbabwe. They do not have the skills, they do not have the capacity to run an economy. He is right that the knowledge they have is knowledge to run a bottle store or a general dealer. Indeed, Zimbabwe has been run like a tax shop and, and this is the problem. The problem is that Zimbabwe has, been, has not been run in the public interest. It has been run in order to satisfy the interests of a very small minority, a very small minority of elites, uh, which never gets satisfied with what it gets. It's always acquiring more. It's always getting more. It's always trying to amass more wealth, more personal wealth. And it does so in flagrant disregard of any interests of other people. And they do so so openly, so brazenly, you know, in a manner which says, what can you do about it? Which is really sad, very unfortunate for the people of Zimbabwe. But he is wrong to make this a general statement about Zimbabwe. Anybody who would make his statement or take his statement as a general description of Zimbabweans would be wrong because Zimbabwe has so much talent, Zimbabwe has so much capacity, it has many people who are willing and able, 
who have the skills, who have the competence to run economies. We have had 40 years to learn. Many of us are working in different parts of the world, working for huge companies, working for international organizations, running companies, running businesses. There is capacity, there is competence among Zimbabweans. The only problem and the only thing that Zimbabweans ask, the only thing that Zimbabweans are demanding is that they be given a fair opportunity, a fair crack in order for them to be able to run the government. If these guys in their lifetime were to step aside and let a new generation of Zimbabweans to take charge of the affairs of the nation, they will be in their own way very proud of what the young Zimbabweans can do. As Zimbabweans, while we are embarrassed by the statements which are made by our Vice President, we have a duty to salvage our national pride. We have a duty to demonstrate that we are much better than what the President, Vice President has said. We have a duty to show the world and of course to show ourselves and future generations that we were capable of standing up and that we were capable of standing up in order to defend our birthright, to defend our economy, and to show that we are more than capable of doing the things that everybody else is doing around the world, which is marching towards a progressive future. Thank you.